Hey, welcome back from, uh, from lunch. You're on the home stretch now. Um, so firstly, I just wanted to point out that uh, with thanks to all of our sponsors, that on your table you'll find um, these cards and leaflets from Exordo. Um, so please do pick them up, have a look at them, get in touch with them, and we thank them for their sponsorship. So this afternoon's session um, is on transformative agreements, the perspective from the United States, um, particularly through the filter of, of data collection and data analysis. We have Michael Levine Clark uh, from the University of Denver and Ben Rawlins from Kentucky. Uh, each will talk for 20 minutes or so, and then we'll have questions for both of them at the end, not in between. Um, and do feel free to use the live chat to ask questions. Otherwise, it's just me talking to Mark Carden, which is a bit like Statler and Waldorf. So with that, Michael. All right. Great, thank you. Um, so let me, so this thing is what I use, huh? Yeah. Um, so I, I, uh, I'm gonna talk about the data that we need to gather in order to do um, the analysis of transformative agreements. Um, and this is, this is building on work that, that I've done with a number of, of colleagues over the last several years. Um, so John McDonald from EBSCO, Jason Price from Skelk, Seth Russell uh, from Taylor and Francis, and um, Heather Staines right here uh, from Delta Think um, have, have participated in some or all of these of the presentations that we've done over over the last several years about uh, trying to figure out how you measure the value and the impact of transformative agreements. So we've given presentations at UKSG, at NASIG, twice at Charleston, and at ERNL, um, digging into different types of data and trying to, to, to help answer the question, um, how, do you, how do you measure the success of a transformative agreement? How do you measure the success from, of, of the reading aspect and of the publishing aspect of, of one of these deals. I'm gonna take a step back from that a little bit today and talk about the underlying data and some of the challenges that we've faced in, in gathering data that can help us answer a really crucial question of, of what do you need to know before you enter a transformative agreement? What's sort of the baseline data, the baseline information that you have to have in order to make a, a decision about whether a transformative agreement or a read and publish deal makes sense for you and your institution. So from the institution's perspective, there are some, some uh, key questions. Um, and I don't know why these slides are so small. Um, they weren't that way before. Um, <laughs> sorry about that. Uh, the, so the, from the institution's perspective, just sort of thinking through um, uh, where you might want to start if you were going to enter into a, into a transformative agreement. Um, does the institution get enough value from that publisher? Um, and that's a fairly easy thing to figure out, right? Do we publish enough with this, with this particular publisher? Do we publish consistently? Is, there, is the pattern roughly the same year over year? Um, and do we get enough usage of that, of that publisher's content? Do we read enough content from that publisher? Pretty basic questions. Um, it's fairly easy, actually, to answer um, at a high level uh, those, those particular questions. And then, how much do we spend with this publisher? It's pretty simple to figure out how much we spend as a library on subscriptions with any given publisher. We know that. It's almost impossible to figure out how much is being spent on APCs with a, with a publisher, but that's a crucial thing to know um, before you enter into one of these agreements. And then a, the, the really hard question is, what is the funding source for APCs? Where is that money coming from? Um, that we really don't have a handle on. A little bit different of a question is, where do my institution's authors publish? Where, right? If I were trying to figure out sort of publishing patterns at a, at a large scale at my institution, um, it's, again, pretty easy to figure out where people publish. But the important question is where they publish as a corresponding author, because APCs are generally charged to the corresponding author. Corresponding author is responsible for, for, for that payment and is therefore what is calculated in the transformative agreement as the, as the volume of, of publishing that matters. 
It's also hard to figure out um, how many of the, those articles are research articles. Um, there are lots of different types of articles, of course, um, and it's, not, it's certainly not the case that every one of these would be something that gets published in an, as an open access article um, involving an APC. Uh, again, the question of, of which are the publishers, and then um, how many articles are, are already open is an important question to think about up front as well. Hybrid, gold, and green. Really, every flavor of open uh, should probably be there as part of that analysis. Again, the question of how much we spend on APCs, um, and, and because those are, those are not um, typically paid by one entity on campus, that's a really hard thing to figure out. And then uh, always, how consistent are those patterns? Are we publishing roughly the same amount and the same types of, of articles year over year with any given publisher? So this thing stopped working. Hmm. All right, thanks everyone. <laughs> Yeah. All right. OK, so now I've got the slides back. Um, great. Uh, so this is, a, this is a slide that Seth from Taylor & Francis put together. He, did a, he, he was searching for um, articles from one particular institution. He did a search in Dimensions. He did another search in Web of Science and another search in Taylor & Francis, um, all for Taylor & Francis articles published in, um, I guess, in 2022. And the numbers don't match up. Interestingly, the, the lowest number of Taylor and Francis articles from that year is in Taylor and Francis. Um, the highest numbers in dimensions, um, they have different numbers of, of gold OA accounted for as well. Uh, there's, oh, oh okay. Um, there is actually an explanation for it, and some of it, it, some of it is just about sort of the timing of when, of when things made it into those, into those um, sources. Uh, but it, there's also some discrepancies in who is counted as, as corresponding author in the different um, databases. Um, th there were some messy affiliation details, not surprisingly. Um, and then there were different uh, uses of article type, right? The article the way the article was defined was varied from, the, from one to another as well. And so that's one publisher, one year, one institution. And it's pretty clear that you'd need to do a lot of cleanup of the data um, just with that amount. So the first, the first problem that, that I want to talk about, the first the thing we've had found to be really challenging is identifying the corresponding author um, and that corresponding author's affiliation, right? Um, so I'm, my screen is blinking at me. Um, all right, can I do it? OK. So um, with the corresponding author, we, we um, y if you're, searching, if you're searching dimensions, if you're searching Scopus, if you're searching Web of Science, and if you're searching pretty much any publisher site, you can't limit to the corresponding author at a particular institution with a particular affiliation, right? So if what I'm trying to do is figure out how much publications does the University of Denver have as corresponding author with this particular publisher or across publishers, I just can't do that, right? I can't answer that question. It's easy to find corresponding author information if you look at each article. It's, it's there, um, but it's not something you can search on. And yet, for understanding a cor uh, the value of, of a, a potential transformative agreement, you have to have that information. Um, we tried looking in some campus information systems, the, the systems where, where um, research information management is, is, is tracked on our campuses, and, and in, those don't necessarily include the author role on a, an article as well. Um, this is, this is just an example of the fact that you, you can see corresponding author in, in records across different 
databases, right? These are these are from Dimensions and Web of Science and a publisher and and Scopus. And there's there's always a a corresponding author indicated, usually with the little envelope, because um, they mailed it in, I guess. <laughs> um, John McDonald, who works at EBSCO, pulled some um, looked at EBSCO publisher feeds, and and he looked at at eight basic metadata elements that are that are pulled in from 48 different publishers. Um, so author, article name, journal name, publisher, those are, those are all present in all 48 of these fields. Um, seven of them lack the document type, right? Doesn't tell you what type of document it is. Um, two of them lack the publication date. One of them lacks an ISSN. Um, and 45 of them lack the corresponding author institution ID, right? So EBSCO is not getting the corresponding author institution ID fed into their system from these publisher feeds. We, um, we created a, a pretty large data set to do some analysis across a range of libraries and a range of publishers. So we started with 10 publishers uh, pulled from dimensions uh, across uh, Across multiple years, uh, we um, we did this for 20 institutions. Eight of them are R1s, which is the largest size research institution in the U.S. Um, and then 12 of them range from from smaller research institutions down to baccalaureate granting institutions. Uh, across this data set, there are 5,845 journals and 106,000 articles. Um, we had to do a lot of cleanup. Right, we cleaned up the corresponding author field um, pretty and took a lot of time on it. We, we um, were able to, to name somebody as a corresponding author if it was a single authored article. That's pretty easy. If it was a multi-authored article with all of the authors from the same institution, also pretty easy. Um, if it was an, and then if it was a multi-authored article um, and we had no idea about institutional affiliation, we, um, we split by institution proportionally. Um, we added some other details to the data set. And then we, we, we realized we needed to remove three publishers um, because um, these three publishers, it's Wiley, OUP, and Taylor and Francis. Um, for whatever reason, Dimensions was showing far less corresponding author data for those three pub publishers. Um, and we've talked to each of those publishers since then. And I don't, this is not meant to be um, a criticism in any way. It's just something worth noting that that the because corresponding author doesn't matter that much or didn't matter that much, um, it's just hard. It, it's not getting fed through. So here's a little bit more about the, the data. 44% um, of this large data set across um, 20 institutions uh, had, had a single author, and we were able to call that the corresponding author. 40% um, had no corresponding author from that institution, but we knew who the corresponding author was, right, from another institution. 12% um, of them had no corresponding author at all, uh, right? We, nobody was listed as the corresponding author. And then the remainder list multiple corresponding authors in various, in various ways. Interestingly, when we look at the open access articles in the data set, um, those that are already open before we before anybody starts a transformative agreement. 50% um, of them have no corresponding author from that institution versus 40% in the, in the set that includes the paywalled articles as well, uh, which is an interesting thing to think about, right? And the, the number of, of single authors is 34% versus 44% in a larger data set. Um, and I think part of that is that different the things that are open are more likely to be multi-authored articles. Um, and clearly, the pattern of where that corresponding author is is, is different for, this, for, for open articles where there's been an APC of some sort than for the, the data set as a whole. So um, from this data set, we, we learned that there are data standards that vary tremendously across the different um, databases, different providers. Um, we had some, some problems with data uh, granularity. There was the, this significant problem with corresponding author data. Um, the the multi-authored articles, are there are a lot of them, and they're hard to determine who the corresponding author is. Um, there's also um, 
some issues with, with um, sort of the article type distribution. Um, one of the things we noticed was that the smaller, less research intensive institutions had more um, book reviews, for example, but they had a different spread of article types than the, than the, the larger research institutions. Um, within Taylor and Francis, uh, Seth uh, noticed some of the same things. Uh, he, you know, he pointed out too that, that the way Taylor and Francis defines a corresponding author, it's really about contacting the publisher, being the one who's responsible for corresponding about the article. And really this, this idea that the APC is attached to the corresponding author um, and their institution is, is something that is new and therefore something that people don't necessarily think about. Uh, so um, we need to have a better understanding of, of it at the publisher level as well. It's also worth noting that affiliation details, whether connected to corresponding author or not, are, are a challenge, right? There are, um, these are often entered by the by the author, or usually entered by the author. Um, author might have different affiliations, and the author affiliation might change over time. Um, there's there's a lot of challenges in in managing um, in managing the affiliation data and understanding the affiliation data. So the second challenge that we encountered is is figuring out the article type, right? Identifying what the type of article was. And here's a, here's a Taylor and Francis journal. These are all of the different article types that somebody could, that, that an article could be assigned by, by Taylor and Francis. Um, the, some of those clearly are not gonna be covered by a transformative agreement, right? You don't make a, an editorial, um, open necessarily, or you certainly don't charge an APC for it. Um, EBSCO had some problems with document type as well. Um, and and um, we had, we had uh, the document type, seven of them didn't indicate the document type at all, and then um, what that document was called was different in, in different feeds as well. In dimensions and scopus in Web of Science, there's different terminology for these things. Um, this is the same search. It's one institution, one year, one publisher um, across uh, Dimension, Scopus, and Web of Science. And, and the, the numbers vary, um, partly because they index different journals, but partly because they, they don't use the same terminology uh, to describe what an article is. This is a, just a pivot table from, um, from Dimensions, and, and the thing that I want to point out is that um, 47 of the articles in, um, the things that are defined as an article in Dimensions for this particular institution in this particular year, 47 of them don't have what article type it is. It's just an article. And 10 of them that are preprints, um, so 46 of the preprints have a, have, are defined as research article, 10 of them don't have any definition as well, right? So if we were trying to use this, this set of data to understand what the impact at our institution for a transformative agreement might be, we don't have an accurate count without going in and looking article by article at, at the amount that's actually a research article. And then the last challenge, and, and this one is, is not so much about the data, it's more about practices, is identifying the APC costs and the funding sources. Right, so um, the question of how much we spend on APCs or have spent on APCs over time is really, really hard to answer. Um, libraries don't know this, um, at least not in the US. Um, we do not know um, who's spending the money on those APCs. Um, the money can be coming from many different sources. It may be, it may be paid by the institution, it may be paid by um, a grant, it may be paid by a department, it could be paid by the library, it could be paid by the Office of Research, and so on. It's, it's not something that we have an answer to. Um, and so without asking the publisher, we have no idea how many, uh, how, how many APCs were associated with the articles published by our institution. We don't know how much was spent on those APCs. And without 
tracking down each and every author to ask them, we have no idea where that money came from. So that's, in some ways, the biggest challenge in, in trying to determine um, sort of what, the, what the, the base level of publication might be prior to entering into, it, into a transformative agreement. So I'm gonna, gonna stop with that and, and um, turn it over to Ben to talk about transformative agreements at uh, University of Kentucky. All right, good afternoon, everybody. I'm one of the four Bens here at the conference this year. Um, so I wanna to talk to you about um, some analysis that we've done, um, trying to get some of the data that Michael's talked about um, at the University of Kentucky. And I'm gonna really try to say University of Kentucky throughout this presentation, because we refer to as UK in the US. So, um, so just a little background. Um, so according to Delta Think's new um, market analysis update in 2022, we're getting closer to half of articles being published um, fee-based open access. So that's inflating the, the OAL market valuation to around $2 billion, which accounts for about 20% of the market value, um, the journal publishing market. The push to OA is driven a lot by funders here in Europe, Coalition S and Plan S in the US, it's the National Institutes of Health and the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy Memo um, or the OSTP Memo. Um, and increasingly, we're seeing publishers focus a lot more of their strategy, particularly around OA. Um, I looked at the recent Elsevier um, um, journal summary for, for 2022, um, and they're seeing a pretty, pretty substantial growth rate for open access articles. So last, or 2022, it was about 25% of all articles published by Elsevier were open fee-based open access, which amounts to about 150,000 of the 611,000 that they published. But from 2019 to 2022, I think that accounted for about a 45% compound annual growth rate for OA, which is significantly um, larger than their um, growth rate for just journal publishing as a whole, which I think stands around 7%. So just a little context, so what I'm gonna be talking about in our analysis is to focus on APC-based transformative agreements. I did put transformative in quotes because I don't really feel that these agreements are necessarily transformative. Um, and really what led us down this analysis was a, a proposal that we received from a publisher. So I'll talk a little bit about that before we jump in. So um, University of Kentucky was proposed a transformative agreement by a large commercial publisher, um, despite being told on three separate occasions that we were not interested in that type of agreement. Um, we told this publisher the amount that we had to spend with them. This agreement was nearly $200,000 more than what that spend was. This agreement only included hybrid journals and the data that we got from them showed that only three um, UK affiliated authors had published in hybrid journals the previous year and the APCs that were allocated as part of this agreement actually exceeded um, all UK affiliated um, publishing output with that publisher in the prior year and that was data that they provided to us. Um, <clears throat> So, um, and the APCs, if we didn't use those within one year, those expired. Um, we asked them, once again, we're not interested. Are you prepared to give us another offer? They were not. Um, so this led us down two different roads to do two different analyses. One I'll talk about here, one I'll just mention briefly. So we did an overall analysis of publication data by um, institutional corresponding authors. And then the second piece was we started to analyze our usage data, um, looking at the back files that we had perpetual access to, um, as well as open access where, where that usage was coming from to determine moving forward whether we needed to continue our relationship with journal subscriptions with this publisher. Spoiler alert, we decided that was not the case, that the data showed that um, about 81% of our usage came from our back files and, and open access. Let's talk for another time. So our methodology and assumptions, so we pulled um, publication data from 2018 to 2022 from Scopus for University of Kentucky corresponding authors. As Michael mentioned, you cannot limit down 
um, in Scopus by corresponding authors. But if you export the data, there is a field that it gives you correspondence address, which helps us narrow that down a little bit more. Although that was a little tricky too, because some authors only put their UK or UKY .edu email, um, others put University of Kentucky, so it was trying to, to make sure that we caught as much as, uh, of both of those as possible. And then we gathered the APC data from publisher websites um, and DOAJ um, for gold and hybrid journals. Combine that data into an Excel spreadsheet, refine some of that with OpenRefine, um, and then populated that into an SQL database that we then created a, a website and some data visualizations. So a few assumptions that we made as a result of this is that the corresponding author paid the APC, um, and that we do think that um, our data analysis is a conservative estimation of both publications and costs. So looking at the overall publication during this period, uh, corresponding authors, UK, we see published, uh, or University of Kentucky, sorry, um, published about 7,000 articles where they were listed as corresponding authors. About 24% of those were open access um, from 355 different publishers across just under 3,000 journals. So as you can see, our article publishing is going up a little and starting to look like it's tapering out from 2021 to 2022. So if we break that down by open access, um, we've guesstimated. Um, to the best of our ability with this, that over that time period, that the University of Kentucky's paid about three and a half million dollars in APC costs. Um, we don't know who's paying that. Um, the library doesn't have a sub of subvention fund that pays for APCs for authors. So we don't know if that's department. We don't know if that's coming from grant. We don't know if that's coming centrally from the provost office or, or where that's coming from. Um, a lot of this publishing is happening in gold open access journals of those 1,633, over 1,400 um, are gold open access, 225 are um, hybrid OA. So if we break this down a little bit more in a gold and hybrid open access, we see we have a pretty steady growth um, at the University of Kentucky in gold open access publishing and kind of a variation year over year with hybrid open access publishing. And of that three and a half million, um, about 2.85 um, of million of the APCs have been paid for gold open access. So if we look at our, our top publishers that we're just publishing with overall, um, not a whole lot of surprises here from a, a research intensive university, Elsevier, Springer Nature, Wiley, Sage, Taylor & Francis, the big five, and then a couple of the um, gold OA publishers um, are in our top 10 overall publishers during this time period. Make sure you all can see that because it's really small here. Um, if we break that down by top OA publishers, um, MDPI is our top OA publisher, um, and then we've broken down the total APCs that we've paid to each of those publishers, um, gold APCs, hybrid APCs for those publishers that, we, that we've paid both for. So we have asked publishers for this data. Um, We've reached out to a lot of the larger publishers to ask if they can get us similar data to do a comparison to see if what we're exporting from Scopus um, matches up. That has been difficult um, to get. We've asked for corresponding author data and APC data. Um, APC data is probably the most difficult to get for whatever reason. Um, several of them responded to us, but the data that we got was very inconsistent or not really what we asked for at all. Um, I got one where I had, was given the article title and the type of journal, whether it was gold or hybrid. Um, when I asked for the APC information, it was the, the second, um, not direct quote, but quote is, we have too many accounting systems across the organization, and this data is difficult to get with any accuracy. The top one um, is an actual quote um, from a publisher's, they just, told us, I don't think we have that info. And that, that literally was the email. There wasn't really much further of an explanation um, to that. 
So now that we have this data, like what are we doing with that? Um, so we're, we're engaging with campus. So as of right now, we've opted not to enter in any, into any transformative agreements with any large publishers. Um, we've had some conversations with campus stakeholders. We've met with deans. We've met with our associate deans for research because every college has one of those. Um, we've met with the Bryce vice president of research and other key stakeholders to try to get some guidance of where the library strategy should move forward um, in regard to open access. We were hoping for some guidance, but as you can see from what I'm about to cover now, we really didn't get um, kind of a clear path forward. Um, some of those stakeholders didn't see open access really as a barrier or a big deal um, because they write this into their grants to pay for APCs. Um, and that, that was a quote that we got from our Vice President of Research. Um, others raised the issue of we don't have access to the same level of funding, either through grants or either at the college level or local, that there's no support for that. Um, the trade-off is although that some wanted to see more um, strategy around open access, they didn't want to see the library cancel any journals as a trade-off to that. Um, and there was a concern that was raised that this entering into any of these types of agreements with larger publishers is kind of the library adding additional pressure on the faculty or where they should publish because we're spending a lot of money into these agreements. So faculty, should faculty prioritize those publishers over other publishers? So our strategy moving forward, we're going to continue with analysis of publication data. Um, we're currently looking at all of the University of Kentucky affiliated um, journal article publications, not just corresponding authors. So some of the things that we're looking at now is what percentage of those journal article research outputs are grant funded. Now we don't have any information of whether the, that grant funding translates to payments of APCs. Um, and then looking at citation levels for OA and non-OA articles um, where our authors are, are publishing and how that breaks down by, by our college department and discipline to see if there are any differences there and maybe if that's a shift to show us that um, a lot of our grant funding is coming in from, from STEM and the health sciences and they use those grants um, to write in their APC, so maybe should we shift our focus to the social sciences and humanities and then look at agreements of, of that nature. Um, myself and our, our collection, our coordinator of collection strategies and our research data librarian are planning to do uh, what we're going to call an open access tour starting in the fall to where we're going to go around to each of the colleges and just sit down with them, hopefully in one of their faculty meetings to just talk through this, to see what their needs are, to see what their pain points are, to get more information and feedback from our campus community. Um, and we're gonna continue to utilize this data and campus conversations to inform our strategy. Um, and we're gonna continue to engage in conversations with publishers uh, around open access. So a few concluding thoughts. Um, we remain skeptical about any APC-based models. Um, I think those are very unsustainable long-term. Um, we were at the Charleston Conference in the US uh, this past November, and what we heard a lot from some of those presentations that this, these APC models really benefit publishers. They don't work out well for institutions or libraries. Um, I think what we found, too, is open is profitable. Um, as I mentioned earlier in the presentation, the open access market um, for journal publishing is about $2 billion. Um, I think we're also seeing that when we look at open educational resources as well, that um, publishers are focusing on both of those. And to kind of wrap this up around, around data, I think it's important that, you know, there is some type of shared standard at, at some point and that we have accurate data that we can analyze. Much like libraries do usage stats for databases, however, with publication data, we can, should be able to have that prior to entering into these agreements so that we can make an informed decision on the value of these agreements. So. Okay. Can we switch to the lapel mics? Can you hear that? Okay, superb. Thank you very much. Thank you. So thank you both. Um, that was excellent and thought-provoking and for some people in the room I think challenging 
Um, so it would be great to hear from uh, any comments, any questions, the European experience um, from publishers. Keith. Can say, I can say a bit about our experiences. We have 17 transformative agreements in place, including with nine out of our top 10 publishers. IEEE seems unable to do a deal. If there's anyone to hear from IEEE, I'd love to see you outside. Uh, I, I, I wanted to come back to Michael's point about the difficulty of tracking down APC payments. It's a very real issue, one that we try to anticipate because we know that a publisher in pricing an agreement will want to add subscription revenue and APC revenue, at least as their baseline. The, the best solution we found was to ask our finance department to track down payments to publishers over the, the relevant period. And they've been fairly successful. The nice thing is that they can then track the payment back to accounts so they can tell us whether it came out of a research grant, a departmental fund, faculty discretionary, whatever source. The only thing we can't find out, and it does happen, is if an individual author pays the APC out of personal funds and simply writes a check. Um, thankfully, that seems not to be too common a practice. Yeah, so, yeah that's, um, that's great advice. I, you know, we, we haven't, at least at my institution, we haven't tried, we haven't tried that yet because we, we're sort of more in the agnostic um, about trans we're more agnostic about transformative agreements and really have only entered into agreements where we don't pay anything more. So we haven't done that work yet. Um, I'm not entirely opposed to the idea of doing transformative agreements for a larger cost, but it would have to be a larger cost that is well under the, the cost of those AP the combined cost of those APCs and those subscriptions. Yeah. Ben, anything to add? No, I, th I think at uh, the University of Kentucky, I think that there is a, an accounting mechanism for APCs, but I don't think that anybody uses that. Um, I think uh, the person that was in my position previously had worked with our finance department to get that as a marker, um, but none of, none of the faculty that we're aware of um, use that. So we've tried to do it through the accounting systems, it's just not um, been consistently used. Yes, Lisa. There we go. I have an incredibly detailed, but this is a very data wonky panel, so I feel I can be justified in this. Um, one of the things that we know happens, especially in the United States under the Holdren memo, is that through Chorus, a number of publishers actually make things open after a delayed period of time. Have you grappled yet with determining whether things that are showing as OA from, say, four years ago actually weren't paid for at all? but actually were paid through essentially subscriptions where chorus and publishers have said, well, as long as we have two years embargo or one year embargo, um, we're just gonna turn this to open after a period of time. And so there is actually no APC paid. So I guess I'm kind of asking whether you've tried to correct your estimates of spend by saying, well, these things were probably made open under Holdren if they're in a hybrid journal. So obviously anything that's in a full gold OA is a different case. But as I said, very data wonky question, but you kind of opened yourself up to it. <laughs> I would say the quick answer to that is no, we haven't looked at it in that way um, as of yet. Yeah, and we didn't we didn't look at that in in our so our the the data set we yeah we really applied APCs to everything that was open, um, and actually we applied the cost of the APCs to anything that might be published right because we were also trying to figure out what the ongoing cost might be as well. But we didn't we didn't account for things that might have become open during that during the time of the data that we were anal analyzing. But it's a good point. And I will add one other thing, like when we did the APC data, we matched that to the APC list that were still available from the publisher. Um, and we used that, I think, um, the 2021 data. So if that journal was still on that list, it calculated that, that APC. Thank you. 
Any more questions, comments, thoughts? Anthony. Sorry, it was a rather naive uh, question, Anthony Watkinson. Would you say that transformative agreements, on the basis of what you, we now, now know, such as it is, um, what are transformative agreements a rational way of getting more journal articles open? And I'm thinking of the comments at the beginning by S, by Project S at the beginning when they said this is terrible, and then they changed their mind slightly. Hmm. Who wants to take I, that? I, I, I can take that. So, I mean, so yes and no. Um, I mean, I think, I think anything that adds more open articles to the ecosystem is a good thing. Um, I, I think it's, I, I, I question whether transformative agreements transform the, the system in any meaningful way um, because it's, it, is it next year when we're transformed? Is it five years from now? Um, right, like I don't, I don't know when that transformation actually happens. So as a, as a mechanism for truly transforming scholarly publishing, I don't think the transformative agreement is, is the model as a way of getting lots more open content out there, um, as long as it doesn't cost my institution significantly more, I'm willing to experiment with it because I think it's, I think it's better than not doing anything. And I think it, even if they're not the, the greatest model right now, at least that they're generating a lot of discussion um, because this, I, I think the model that we're in now can't be the model that we end up at, but it seems like we're at the very start of this and where we go from here, and I, I don't have really any good solutions <laughs> to this right now either, but I think it, it's definitely generating a lot of conversation um, about how we do OA, how we do OA equitably across institutions um, to make sure that we're not you know, creating you know, barriers from, from readers to people who publish now, which I feel like some of these transformative agreements do, we just shift, shift barriers one way to the next. So. Thank you. Bernie? Not yet. Quite a loud voice. Thank you. Um, that was really interesting. I just wondered, it kind of follows on from what both of you just said, if either of you have um, had internal discussions about models or, uh, well, things like subscribe to open. I, on a recent S2O call, and Tasha from Counter isn't here, but she was, she was saying some really interesting things about um, how we're becoming able to see usage based at institutional level, regional level, country level, and it can be quite powerful data to um, argue for the equity of the model and a good use of, of spend. So I just wondered if you, what you have to say about that model or any others that you might have considered or even just talked about. Thank you. I'm sorry, I'll, I'll take this one first. I think there's a lot of promise in the S2O model. Um, I think it does seem more equitable, but I think it's right now it's really early to tell and I don't know that that model will translate to commercial publishers. I think it works a lot really well for smaller university and society publishers, but I don't know that we'll see a lot of um, larger commercial publishers signing off on that just because it's it would be like a dip in revenue um, for them, so. Yeah, I mean, I think I, 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 I like that model much more than I like the, the read and publish model um, or an APC model generally. Um, and we're participating in, in, in some, of those, some of those programs. You know, my, my worry about that is that, is it five years down the road or is it 10 years down the road where, you have, in, you have enough of that content open and enough confidence that lots of libraries are participating that libraries start to pull out of it because of budget cuts, right? And they make the, they make the rational decision that they're not gonna contribute to that project because there's a reasonable chance it will stay open. And if enough libraries make that decision, um, it, ceases right ceases to be a sustainable model I so I work I do worry about that especially if if the things we're doing it with are thing are the publishers we're doing it with or the or the the content that we're doing it with is is content that in some ways could be perceived as as less important than some of the big publisher packages thank you 
Any more questions or comments? So while you're having a think about that, um, one from me, Ben, you, you talked about um, the desirability of a common data standard and then that being a, a challenge in front of us. How would that be solved and by whom? Oh, that's a big question. Well, I think we have standards around usage data, so I, I think it's a community-based thing. I don't think that you know publishers will solve this or libraries will solve this. I think it's conversations with all of us of like what, like what do libraries and institutions need? I think that's a start. Um, of like what do we need to, to be able to um, evaluate these types of things? Um, like I said, we have pretty standard metrics with with usage data. I'd like to see something pretty pretty similar to that because even when you look, try to look at affiliation data, like Michael's mentioned, it is a little all over the place, given just sometimes how authors even enter in that data when they're submitting their articles. Um, so some will enter in their department, some will enter their college, some will enter in the institution, some will not do any of that. Mm -hmm. um, some will not use their institutional email. So I think having a conversation about how we can, you know, maybe require authors to do certain standards around like when they're submitting that so what way when that export um, that data is exported and shared that there's more consistency across that right yep. yeah um, so I would I agree with that with that and I, I would add that you know and this sort of follows um, Bernie's comment um, about counter um, having a better understanding of global usage of the content that we've helped make open um, is, I think, an important piece of this that, that, right, so we often, I think, talk about what is the impact on my institution and my institution's authors, but what is the impact of, of my participating in, in any initiative to make content open? That, I think, is a really valuable thing that I would want to have, have information about so I could decide whether these are, whether, whether participating in any of these open access uh, models is a good thing and a worthwhile thing for my institution to do. Right. No, that makes sense. We still have just a, a little bit more time. If anybody else had anything to chip in or to ask, um, otherwise we can release you slightly early. <laughs> so, yes, <clears throat> Antonia. I'm sorry. Um, Wait, I think Antonia just had her hand up there. Anthony, then I'll come back to you. <laughs> Thank you. You got excited by being released early. <laughs> um, this might be as much a question for Keith, who's, who's uh, experienced with lots of transformative agreements, but I'm, I'm sure you have some, as you've, as, as you've described. Um, one of the things that's puzzling for a publisher like myself is where we have transformative agreements and where we've demonstrated, and we do do quite a lot of this work to demonstrate how citations and usage is actually higher in, in open access instances, we still have numbers of authors at those institutions who choose not to publish open access despite all the benefits, despite the fact that there's no paywall for them to have to pay an APC because it's taken care of. Do you have any understanding of, of why? Because we, we, you know, we might get 85% take up at an institution why isn't it 100, even when we've gone back to those authors, worked with the librarian to explain to them the benefits? Do we still need to educate people about the, the value of open access publishing? Is that back to having the statistics to show that it is beneficial, do you think? Yeah, um, so, I mean, it's a great question, and it's one, I don't have an answer to it, but it's one that I've wondered about quite a bit. Um, so we, have, we do have some transformative agreements. Um, and uh, including including with IOP, um, and and have noticed that same pattern. Uh, Jason Price from Skelk um, is working on some of that data for deals that are managed across the many Skelk schools, and it's something that we're we're trying to tease out the the, the patterns. Um, but I but I, do, I I do and I do know from talking to faculty more broadly, there are some who, are, who still um, as associate open access with poor quality, right? That, that this is something that they are, they have not figured out yet that, that it, the quality and the openness are not 
correlated, right? Um, so there's some of that, but I, but I, but I wonder too, and, and I don't know whether some of it, I, I assume some of it is I'm submitting an article, I'm going through the steps for, for that process, and I see this option to make it open, and I assume that there's going to be some challenge or problem or cost associated with so I don't do it, right? I assume that happens. But if you're contacting them and, and asking why, then I have no idea. Yeah, uh, just to add a little bit to that, I will say we've heard similar things about, like people still have that perception about open as lower quality. Um, and I think another thing that I've heard from other institutions is that when faculty are given that option in the submission systems, it's a little confusing to them of what that open option is. I think some people have had it labeled like this is included in like the library pays for this or something along those, those lines, which leads to, I think, maybe a misunderstanding of is that an additional cost that the library's paying that's gonna come out of, out of something else. So I, I would say we're just gonna to have to continue this education probably in perpetuity um, for people as we get new, new researchers and new faculty at our institutions. So we have Lisa and Anthony to, to bring us home. Anthony, I think you were, you were first. Um, just a couple of quick ones it's each, quick, that'd be great. A quick one related to Antonio's question. We found that um, some um, of the early career researchers we've stud been studying wanted to go for the top journals in their field. And there's the so top journals, higher quality of peer review, for example, more supportive uh, peer review. And that's, that's one reason. Another thing is we did find some people, much to their surprise, suddenly had their articles becoming open access because of transformative agreements. They said, good Lord, Elsevier, we can be, in this Elsevier journal, we can be open access now. That's a surprise. Okay, so I was going to ask another question. Books, we haven't talked about monographs at all, or the humanities, at all. Why not? Um, so I, I care a lot about the, the humanities and I care a lot about books and, and in fact, I feel like every year here I go to the workshop on open access monographs. Um, and I think it's an important topic. Um, I, I, I don't know that, I don't know that there's a transformative agreement model. Um, I think that, you know, the model, there are some really promising um, purchase to open types of models, um, right, from, from JSTOR, from multiple publishers, Bloomsbury, Cambridge, there, there's, there are publishers who are, who are experimenting with that, and in some ways, that's more appealing to me than, than a read and publish deal for, for journal content. So maybe just Lisa, then last question or thought. Sure. Um, so this is actually going to be an answer <laughs> um, because I, I, there is one really interesting research report on how transformative agreements affect researcher behavior as well as why people opt out. And, um, but it's in a classic problem where it's a report. It wasn't published as a journal article, so no one knows it exists. It, it, people do. So I highly commend people to read the Wiley Project Deal um, report on the, <clears throat> the data that comes out of the Wiley Agreement after three years. Uh, first of all, showing that indeed transformative agreements draw authors away from other publishers. So there's a real market share question for publishers <clears throat> of why they might want to be having transformative agreements because it creates, it removes friction for authors. But they also documented a number of opt-outs and why. Um, they went to some of those authors and found why. And there is also a fundamental that was mentioned by Yvonne earlier today. The um, I don't care because I think paying for publishing is bad. And like it's a, it's a moral, ethical kind of position that a number of people have taken. In addition, in Germany, the particular additional sort of tie of that to academic freedom there of the you can't make me. Um, and therefore, I'm going to take a stand here that you absolutely can't make me. So there's, a, there's some interesting cultural and um, uh, ideological reasons coming in. But since that's actual data on the topic, I just thought this, this group would probably be interested. Great. Thank you, thank Lisa, you. very much.
Okay, well, I think we're just about on time. So thank you very much, Michael and Ben. That was absolutely excellent. Thanks, everybody. Really good.